In this section, we're going to look at the built-in data structures in Python, which are extremely important when building real applications. First, we're going to look at lists, and then we'll look at tuples, sets, and dictionaries. So earlier you have seen that we can use square brackets to define a list or a sequence of objects. In between these brackets, we can have objects of any type. So we can have a list of strings like this, and then assign it to a variable like letters. We can also have a list of numbers, booleans, or even a list of lists. Let me show you. So here we have a list. Each item in this list will be a list itself. So here's the first item, which is a list of two items. Now let's add another item to our main or parent list. This item is also a list with two items. So now we have a matrix, which is a two dimensional list. Now let me show you some cool tricks. Let's say you want to have a list of a hundred zeros. You don't want to manually create that like this. That's very ugly. Let me show you a better way. So we define a list of one item, one zero, and then we can multiply it by a hundred. And the result will be this. Let me show you. Print zeros. Here it is. There you go. So using a star or an asterisk, we can repeat the items in a list. Now, similarly, we can use a plus to concatenate multiple lists. Let me show you. So first, I'm going to change this to five. Now let's define a variable combined, which is our zeros list plus letters. Let's see what happens. Print combined, you know it. So we have five zeros followed by A, B, C. As you can see in Python, every object in a list can be of a different type. So they don't have to be exactly the same type. We can combine a list of numbers with strings and booleans or even lists. Now let's say you want to have a list of numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 20. You don't want to type all of these by hand. There is a better way. So we have this list function. As you can see, this function takes an iterable. So we can pass any iterable here and convert it to a list. Earlier, you learned about the range function. This function returns a range object, which is iterable, which means we can iterate or loop over it. So here we can call this function and pass 20. And with this, we can create a list of numbers from 0 to 20. Let me show you. So let's store it in numbers and then print it on the terminal. There you go. So 0 up to 20. But note that 20 itself is not included. As another example, let's call the list function and pass a string. Earlier, I told you that strings are also iterable. We can loop over them. So we can pass them to the list function and see what we get. Let's print chars on the terminal. So you can see each character in our original string is an item in this list. So these are a few different ways to create a list in Python. Now that we have a list, we can get the number of items in that list using the len function. So here we have a list of four items. We can use square brackets to access individual items in this list. So let's print letters of zero. This will return the first item in this list. So when we run this program, we'll get A. Now, similar to strings, if we pass a negative index here, like negative one, this will return the first item from the end of the list. So when you run this, we'll get D. Using square brackets, we can also modify items in the list. So let's change the first item to a capital A and then print the entire list. There you go. So this is the basic of accessing individual elements in a list. Now, earlier in the course, you learned that we can use two indexes to slice a string. We have the exact same concept here. So we add square brackets, first index, colon, second index. And 
this will return a new list with the first three items in our original list. So if we print our original list, you can see that it's not changed. Now, just like strings, if you don't specify the first argument, zero will be assumed by default. So as you can see, these two expressions produce the exact same result. Similarly, if you don't include the end index, by default, the length of the list will be used here. So this expression will return a new list with all the items in the original list. And similarly, we can also exclude the start index here. And with this syntax, we can get a copy of our original list. There you go. Now, when slicing a string, we can also pass a step. And this is useful in situations where you want to return every second or every third element in the original list. So now when we run this code, we'll get A and C. So B will be skipped. Let me show you using a better example. So I'm going to delete everything here. Create a new list called numbers. Here we're going to use the list function and pass range of 20. Let's print our list. So we get numbers 0 to 19. Okay. Now let's see what happens when we add square brackets here with two colons and two. This will return every other element in the original list. Take a look. So we get all the even numbers. 0, 2, 4, and so on. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Here is another cool thing you can do here. Let's change the step to negative 1. As you can see, this will return all the items in the original list, but in reverse order. So these are some useful things you can do with lists. Next, we'll look at unpacking lists. Say that we wanted to add an item to our list. There are a couple of ways we can do this. So first, if we just wanted to add an item to the end of our list, then we could use the append method. So let's say that we want to add art to our courses. So we can just say courses dot append and we want to append art. So now if I remove this slicing and just print out our courses list and run that, then you can see that art was appended here to the end of the list. Now, if we wanted to instead add art to a specific location in our list, then we could instead use the insert method. Now, insert takes two arguments. First, it takes the index where you want the to insert the value, and then the value itself. So if I wanted to insert art to the beginning of our list, then we could say courses.insert. And now the first argument is the location. So let's just say location zero, which is the beginning. And then the value that we want to insert, which is art. So if we run this, now we can see that art was inserted at position zero. Now that only inserted the value. It didn't override anything. So you can see that all the other courses are still here, but they just got shifted. Now, another way of adding values to our list is using the extend method. Now, sometimes this confuses people, so let's look at what this does. So we want to use extend when we have multiple values that we want to add to our list. So for example, let's say that we have another list here called courses2, and we'll set this equal to another list uh, with art and education in this list. And we want to add these values to our original courses list. So first, let's see what happens if we use this insert method. So instead of inserting art to the beginning of our list, let's instead insert these courses to the beginning of our list. So let's go ahead and run this.
So we can see that at the beginning of our list that it actually added the entire list of courses to and not each individual value. So we can actually have a list within a list like we have here. So if we were to print the first value of our courses list, so I'll print out the index of zero and run that, then we can see that now the first value is actually this list itself. But this isn't really what we wanted. We wanted to add all of those values from our second list to our original list. Now that is why we use the extend method. So let's go ahead and set this back to the way it was to just print the courses. Now instead of inserting here, we'll instead use extend. And it only takes one argument, which is the iterable. So we will extend courses with courses too. So now if we run this, then we can see that when we did courses.extend with courses too, that it added the values from our second list uh, here to our original. So a lot of people get that mixed up with append and extend. So again, uh, if you were to append it, just like with insert, then it's just going to append the list itself on there instead of the each individual item. So if we use extend, then now we can see that each individual item is extended onto that list. Okay, so now let's look at how we can remove some items or remove some values from our list. Now one way to remove values is to just use the remove method. So if we were to say courses.remove, then let's say that we wanted to remove math. So if we save that and run it, then we can see that math was removed from the courses list. Now there's also a way of removing values with this pop method. So if we say courses pop. Now by default, this will remove the last value of our list. Now this is useful if we want to use our list like a stack or a queue. So if we run this like it is, then we can see that comp sci was popped of our, off of our list and now we just have these three courses. Now one other thing about pop is that it returns the value that it removed. So we can actually set a variable uh, and grab that returned value. So if I set a variable here and say popped equals courses.pop and then I was to print this above our courses here and run that, then we can see that it grabbed that comp sci value that was popped off of the list. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to loop over lists. So here we have a list of three items. We can use our four loops to loop over this list. So four, letter, in letters, colon, and then we print each letter. Save the changes and run the code. We get A, B, C. Now, what if we want to get the index of each item as well? Well, we have a built-in function called enumerate. We call it here, and this will return an enumerate object, which is iterable. In each iteration, this enumerate object will give us a tuple. Let me show you. So now when we run this code, look, in each iteration, we're getting a tuple. So a tuple, as I told you before, is like a list, but it's read-only. We cannot add new items to it. So in each iteration, we're getting a tuple of two items. The first item in this tuple is the index, and the second item is the item at that index. So now to get the index, we can use square brackets to access the first item in this tuple. So if we print letter of zero, we will get the indexes. And right next to that, we can add letter of one. So we will see the item at a given index. But this syntax is a little bit ugly. In the last lecture, you learned about list unpacking. So if we have a list with two items, zero and A, we can unpack it into two variables like this, index, comma, letter equals items. So here we are unpacking the items list. Now, what if we change square brackets to parentheses? Now we have a tuple and we can still unpack this tuple. So you saw that this enumerate function returns an enumerate object, which is iterable. In each iteration, this enumerate object will return a tuple that looks like this. So we can unpack it right here. 
So we add another variable index. Now with this, we no longer have to use square brackets and we can simply print index and letter. Let's run this code. There you go. So now we don't need this anymore. So to recap, you can use for loops to iterate over lists. If you also need the index, you should call the enumerate function. This will return an enumerate object, which is iterable. In each iteration, it will return a tuple and you can unpack that tuple right here. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about dictionaries in Python. We use dictionaries in situations where we want to store information that come as key value pairs. Here's an example. Think of a customer. A customer has a bunch of attributes like name, email, phone number, address, and so on. Now, each of these attributes has a value. For example, the name can be John Smith. The email can be john at gmail.com. The phone can be whatever. So what we have here is a bunch of key value pairs. So in this example, our keys are name, email, and phone, and each key is associated with a value. So this is where we use a dictionary. With a dictionary, we can store a bunch of key value pairs. So let me show you how to define a dictionary in Python. Back to our program, I'm going to define a variable, customer, and here we set it to curly braces. With these curly braces, we can define a dictionary. In this example, we have an empty dictionary that doesn't have any key value pairs. Now we can add one or more key value pairs in between the braces. So let's add a key value pair here. I'm going to set the key to name and the value to John Smith. Then we add a comma to add another key value pair. So let's set age to 30. Let's add another key value pair is underline verified and we set this to a boolean now what matters here is that these keys should be unique so if i add another key value pair here let's set age to 40. now look pycharm has highlighted the age key because we have duplicated that and that's not allowed so each key should be unique in a dictionary just like the dictionaries we have in the real world in a real dictionary we have a bunch of words and their definition each word is listed only once in a dictionary we don't have the word book twice. So let's delete this second duplicate key value pair. So the keys should be unique. And in this example, I'm using strings, but they can also be numbers. We're going to look at that later. But the value can be anything. It can be a string, a number, a Boolean, a list, literally anything. Now we can access each item in this dictionary using square brackets. So we type customer square brackets and then specify a key, like name. And this will return the value associated with the name key. Let's print it on a terminal, have a look. There you go, so the name is John Smith. Now what if we pass a key that doesn't exist? Let's say birth date, run the program. We get a key error because we don't have a key called birth date. Also, if you spell name with, let's say a capital N, we get the same error because we don't have a key with the exact same sequence of characters in this dictionary. Now to get around this, we can use the get method. Let me show you. So 
instead of using the square brackets, we call the get method and specify our key. Now, if we use a key that doesn't exist here, it doesn't yell at us. For example, if we pass birth date, it simply returns the non value. Earlier, I told you that non is an object that represents the absence of a value. So instead of getting a key error, we get none. Now we can also optionally supply a default value. For example, if this dictionary doesn't have this key, we can supply a default value. Let's say January 1st, 1980. Let's run the program. Now, instead of getting none, we get this default value. So this is how we can access the value associated with a key in a dictionary. We can also update these values. For example, before a print statement, we can write code like this, customer of name. Let's update the name to Jack Smith. Now, this little warning here is telling us that we could simply put Jack Smith here instead of defining it once and then update it. Don't worry about that. It doesn't really matter. Now with this line, if we print the name of this customer, we should see Jack Smith. Let me show you. So I'm going to use the square bracket notation again. Let's print the name of the customer. You can see that is updated here. We can also add a new key here. Let's set the birth date to some value like January 1st, 1980. And then we can print it here. So as you see, we can easily add new key value pairs to a dictionary. So this is the basics of using dictionaries in Python. They're extremely important and they have a lot of applications in the real world. Okay, here's an exercise for you. So here we have this program that asks our phone number. Let's type one, two, three, four. We type it in digits and then this will translate it to words. Take a look, enter. It prints one, two, three, four. That's a pretty cool program. So go ahead and spend a few minutes on this exercise. It's pretty easy. I will see you next. All right, so first we need to get the user's phone number. We call the input function with the label phone. We get the result and store it in this variable. Now let's say the user enters one, two, three, four. So we need to loop through this string, get each character and translate it to a word. So what we need to implement this scenario is a dictionary because a dictionary is a structure that allows us to map a key to a value. So we can have a dictionary with keys like one, two, three, four, and we map each of these keys to a word. So we can map the digit one to the word one. We can map two to TWO. You got the point. So let's define a dictionary. We can call it digits underline mapping. Now in this dictionary, I'm going to add a few key value pairs. One, we map it to one, two, to two, three, to three, and finally, four, to four. Now technically, we should add all the digits from zero to nine, but I don't want to waste your time typing repetitive things here. You got the point. So let's move on. Now we need to loop through the phone string. So four, character in phone we get each character and then use it to access a key value pair in our dictionary so digits underline mapping we can use square brackets or call the get method i would prefer to use the get method so in case the user enters some character that is not part of our dictionary our program is not going to yell at them so we call the get method and pass this character as the key and if we don't have this key, we can supply a default value, like an exclamation mark. So with this, we'll get a word. Now we need to add this word to an output string. So we can define an output string. Initially, we set it to an empty string. In each iteration, we get this and add it to our output string. So we type output plus equals this. And we should also add a space at the end. So the words are not close to each other. Okay, that's all we have to do. Now, finally, let's print this output, run our program. So I'm going to type one, three, four, five. Let's see what we get. We get one, three, four with an exclamation mark. 